Sometime back in the early 1990s, I presented a lecture to the Oklahoma Metaphysical Society on spiritual growth. After my teaching, someone came up and said that it was good to hear a teaching from an old soul. What do you mean by that? I asked. What do you mean, old soul? I was only about 44, 45 years old at the time. Well, he said, no one could have given the lecture you just gave unless they had lived many lifetimes as a spiritual teacher. So I replied, I can show you all the books in my library and the correspondence with others that went into this presentation. It didn't matter. In this man's mind, I was an old soul. I thought maybe I should have upped my honorarium fee for all that extra experience in extra lifetimes, but I didn't say anything about that. Through the years, I've been in many discussions on the topic of reincarnation and have heard people describe why they believe in it. Often when I've shared my doubts as a Christian, I was sometimes told that Jesus himself taught reincarnation and that the early church believed this as well, but it was quashed by a powerful pope in the 6th century. Is that true? What did Jesus teach about reincarnation? And what did the early Christians believe about this? A recent Pew poll indicates that one-third of Americans believe in reincarnation in some form. So answering these kinds of questions is important today. And I hope this presentation makes a contribution in that regard. What do we mean when we use the term reincarnation? Reincarnation refers to the movement of a soul or consciousness into a new body from one lifetime to another. That the consciousness inhabiting a body at one time in history inhabits a different one at a later time. This is usually understood as rebirth into another human body, but it might be, in some systems, understood as a possible rebirth, as a different kind of animal, or even a whole different kind of being. So there's a variety of ways this is taught, but what's common to them all is that the individual consciousness leaves a body with death and then enters another to live another lifetime. Two very similar terms, transmigration and metempsychosis, there are different nuances, but for purposes of this presentation, we'll consider them to be practically synonymous with reincarnation. Two other terms we need to be aware of. Resuscitation refers to reviving or restoring the life of an individual in their body. They were dead, or seemed so, but then came back to life and finished their lives in the same body that eventually did die and stayed dead. Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead is an example of this. Resurrection, on the other hand, is restoring the life of an individual in their same body, which has been radically transformed in such a manner that it will not die again. The example here is Jesus, and we'll say more about that later. Among the religions of the world and philosophical systems where reincarnation is taught, there's much variation, but several general themes. Some teachings hold that souls existed before birth in a spiritual realm, where they behaved badly and suffered the consequences of a kind of fall into matter and life in a body. In this view, embodied life is viewed negatively but it is an opportunity to reform and become transformed spiritually. Another view is that incarnate souls, who might or might not have pre-existed in the spiritual realm, die before undergoing much moral and spiritual development, and so they are reincarnated as a human, or in some systems, another kind of animal, or maybe another kind of being on a different planet. I've heard spiritual teachers describe their own journey in those terms. Third, rebirth circumstances are determined by the quality of life one has lived before. 
and they present opportunities for important lessons to be learned. There's a kind of view here that there really are no victims, that you get what you deserve. Someone once told me that they had learned through their past life work that they had been an abuser in a past life, and that's why they were being abused in this one, that the tables had sort of turned. So at least your embodied life can present an opportunity to improve your rebirth circumstances, taking you one step closer to full liberation or enlightenment. People who believe in reincarnation will cite two sources of evidence for it. The first is déjà vu, a sense that you've been somewhere before, at another time, that it looks and feels familiar, but you're not sure why. A famous example of this comes from World War II General George C. Patton. As he traveled through Europe and various battlefields, he had a sense that he'd been there before, had fought battles there before. He wrote a poem about it, Through a Glass Darkly is the name of the poem, in which he recounts some of these battles in other lives. He even believes he was present at the crucifixion of Jesus. A second source is past life recall, that people actually remember those previous lives, or claim to. Sometimes mystics, especially from Hinduism and Buddhism, claim they remember their previous lives and what they experienced and what lessons they're supposed to be learning in this life. Past life recall is not something we find among Christian, Jewish, or Islamic mystics. There's also the practice of past life regression in clinical hypnosis, where one follows a feeling back in time to your early experience of it, not only in this life, perhaps in previous lives as well. The book, The Psychic Lives of Taylor Caldwell, recounts this famous novelist's own experience in past life regression. The author Raymond Moody, famous for his book, Life After Life, also has a book entitled Life Before Life, in which he discusses reincarnation experiences that people have shared with him. So those are the two main sources, and as you can see, they're both mainly experiential. Reincarnation in some form has been and is still being taught in various philosophies, spiritualities, and religions. Examples of philosophers include Pythagoras, Plato, Plotinus, Nietzsche. We have no time to discuss their specific beliefs, I'm just mentioning them only here. The first three, especially Plato, would influence early Christian thinkers. So hold that thought. We'll be coming back to it a little later. Among the religions of the world, we find mostly the Asian ones, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism, that teach reincarnation. The New Age spiritualities that we find in the West also draw heavily from Hinduism, Buddhism, and modern psychology, and generally, reincarnation is part of the perspective of people who practice New Age spirituality. Turning now to Judaism, the religion in which Jesus was raised. In his time, there were two major groups of Jewish leaders, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. For the Sadducees, there was no belief in an afterlife. Thought was that the dead rest in Sheol, a realm of the dead, a place of stillness and darkness. Both good and evil alike went there. The metaphysical status of such souls is vague, but it's mentioned 66 times in the Bible. It was to this realm that the soul of Jesus descended when he died, bringing with him the liberating light and power of God infused into his soul by the word, or logos, of God. For the Sadducees, retribution and reward were to be found in this life. The Pharisees, on the other hand, believed in the immortality of the soul, in reward and punishment, both in this life and after death. 
even resurrection of the body on the last day. And so their views were much more in line with what Christianity came to believe eventually. I'll mention here Kabbalah, an esoteric mystical interpretation of scripture that developed from the 12th century onward. It's a complicated system, focusing on inner experience as a means of liberation. The concept of reincarnation is largely rejected by Jewish biblical scholars today, an exception being Hasidic Judaism, which draws from Kabbalah and teaches a form of reincarnation called Gilgul. Only about 5% of Jews identify themselves with this movement. The early Christians had the teachings of Judaism, Jesus, Paul, and other apostles to form them. And there's no evidence that reincarnation was part of those teachings. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 27, we read, It is appointed for men to die once and be judged by God. This is probably not intended to be a sweeping metaphysical pronouncement, but it's surely not moving in the direction of reincarnation either. Reincarnation was found in early Christianity, taught by some Gnostic leaders like Valentinus, also by the Manichaeans, and other groups that were largely influenced by Plato, but other teachers as well. One manifestation of this belief was that the soul pre-existed in eternity, that it was a spark of the divine that had fallen into the realm of matter. This teaching was called pre-existianism. It was eventually rejected at the Second Council of Constantinople in the 6th century. The theologian Origen is sometimes listed as a teacher of reincarnation, but many scholars maintain that he only taught the pre-existence of the soul before birth, but not its continuing incarnation in birth after birth. It's doubtful that reincarnation was widely believed in early Christianity. Teachings about it and a Gnostic view that matter was evil were opposed by a number of Christian teachers early on. Irenaeus, for example, a teacher in 2nd and 3rd century Christianity, wrote a book called Against Heresies, and in chapter 39, it's about the absurdity of the doctrine of transmigration of souls. And his main point in that chapter was that we don't remember our previous lives, so how could we benefit from them? Also from some of the Gnostics was the view that matter was a bad thing, somehow inherently evil, that life in a body was not a good thing, it was a curse. The early Christians rejected that as well. Christ was incarnate in a real human body. Everything God created was good, and that included the matter of the body and the body itself. I've mentioned the teachings of Jesus, so let's take a closer look. What he taught was the four final things, or sometimes called the four last things. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. We'll all die and we'll be judged by God and receive our eternal reward in heaven or condemnation and damnation in hell. His views then were more in line with the Pharisees than the Sadducees, only he really seemed to have personal knowledge of what life beyond death was like. What he taught was resurrection not reincarnation. And we can expect that he would have been more emphatic in teachings about reincarnation if that had been part of his message and his understanding. But he did not teach this. He also had a very positive view of the body and its goodness. He did not believe the body was sinful or evil, like some of the later Christian Gnostics did. Sinful ways, he taught, issued from the mind and the heart, not from consuming certain foods, nor less from the fact of having a body. 
He was very much about healing the body and giving it proper food and drink. He himself was even criticized for not being a harsh ascetic like John the Baptist. At the wedding feast in Canaan, he turned a 150 or so gallons of water into wine to keep a wedding reception rolling. He referred to his own body as a temple of the Spirit, the place where God dwelt. And Paul would refer to ours in the same way in some of his writings. What then about Jesus' remark in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, that John the Baptist was really Elijah the prophet, who had lived nine centuries earlier? This incident is sometimes cited as proof that Jesus really did believe in reincarnation, even if he didn't teach about it. Let's take a closer look. Elijah, as we've said, was a prophet who lived in the ninth century before Christ. He was a miracle worker, even resuscitated a widow's son to life. It's said that he himself did not experience physical death, but was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire with horses of fire in a whirlwind. You can read about it in the second book of Kings, chapter 2. The biblical book of the prophet Malachi dates from sometime in the 5th century before Christ, and in chapter 4 we read his preaching about the day of the Lord. We begin in verse 5. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children, and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. On then to Matthew 17, verses 9 to 13, which describes an exchange between Jesus and Peter, James, and John as they were descending Mount Tabor following the experience of Jesus' transfiguration. In verse 9, we begin, As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. And what they had seen was the transfiguration of Jesus, vision of Moses and Elijah, and they'd heard the voice of the Father. Then verse 10, the disciples asked him, Why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. The expectation seemed to be that since Elijah had not died, but had been taken up in a chariot of fire, that he would return to inaugurate the age of the Messiah. So the three were wondering about this. Jesus' response that Elijah had indeed come is understood by most biblical scholars in terms of the prophetic spirit and ministry of Elijah manifesting in the ministry of John the Baptist. Spirit here is not to be understood as a soul reincarnated, but of a charism or ministry gift. Now a deeper dig into this issue. In Luke 1, we read of the angel appearing to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, announcing the birth of John. Verse 16, He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So John the Baptist will come in the spirit and power of Elijah. That's pretty clear. Later, when John was grown and actively ministering, John himself was confronted with the question of his identity. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 19 to 21, we read, And this is the witness of John, 
when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he said, No. So there we have it again. He was asked directly, Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. There's nothing in New Testament writings that can be taken as support for reincarnation, unless one believes the New Age story that all references to it were erased by the Second Council of Constantinople in 553. What that council condemned was pre-existianism, which we've touched on already. But thousands of manuscripts predating that time are identical to those we have today in their treatment of the passages we've just discussed. There was no going back, as some have said, and changing all of those writings so that they struck out all references to reincarnation. That's just not so. Let's take a closer look at resurrection and how it's different from reincarnation. The first thing to note is that with resurrection, we're speaking of one body versus many. And this is the rub for many people doesn't seem right. So many people don't have much of a life. Is this it? With reincarnation, it seems more fair. You're given many lifetimes to have many experiences and many chances to get your act together spiritually. But we don't really know what kind of growth continues in the afterlife, what kind of development continues. For example, as 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 puts it, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of humans the things that God has prepared for those who love him. So we just don't know. It could be way more wonderful in the opportunities for growth than we can even imagine. In Christianity, the body is considered integral to who we are as humans. It's not an accidental vessel or bio space suit for the soul to pick up and lay down again in life after life. Resurrection is not merely about a ghost-like or spiritualist phenomenon. The apostles knew about that. They knew that King Saul had summoned Samuel, the prophet, through divination. The risen Jesus is more than that, and more than a disembodied soul. A third point. The teaching is that the soul is to be reunited with the body on the last day. The general resurrection. God will reunite soul and body. Even the damned will be raised, but not glorified. How God will do this, we don't know. The body will, of course, have decomposed completely by then. But God, who created us in the first place, can do anything. This has been a belief of the church from the beginning. We find in the old Roman symbol, for example, a kind of profession of faith that was predecessor to the Apostles' Creed all the way back in early 2nd century Christianity, reference to the resurrection of the flesh. That's what they proclaimed. That's what they believed would happen on the last day. And that Jesus is the first fruit of the fullness of this resurrection. Point number four. Between our individual death and the general resurrection is what is called the intermediate state. And this is already alluded to in some parts of the Old Testament. The belief is that the soul is spiritual and immortal and lives on beyond death. It receives its judgment at death, or heaven or hell, and begins to participate in its reward or punishment which will be finalized at the general resurrection on the last day. Purgatory is a belief by Catholics and some other groups in a process of purification and growth for souls open to God, but not yet fully perfected. It takes place in the intermediate stage. But even souls in the intermediate stage can, once they're purified, enjoy fully the vision of God, 
which is called the beatific vision. And point number five. Resurrection is the total transformation of the body and overcoming of death itself, far more than release from the cycle of ongoing incarnations. It implies a fully inspirited, glorified body. Writing in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 42 to 44, the Apostle Paul notes, The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Our understanding of what we mean by spiritual body is informed by Jesus and his resurrection, which we read about in the New Testament. Christians believe that faith in the crucified and risen Jesus enables us to share in his own victory over sin and death, undermining the necessity of reincarnation to overcome imperfection. There's something much better than numerous rebirths as a way to liberation, and that's Jesus and his risen life, and our sharing in that life with him and one another.